As Michael mentioned there, the themes of the conference, there are two interrelated ones that I was asked to cover in my uh, presentation today. The first, why has our penal system failed us? The second, how can we make it more effective? And I was asked to place my comments in an Irish uh, context. As I was collecting my thoughts for this exercise and reflecting on developments over the last 20 years or so, I was struck by the extent to which the penal policy arena in Ireland is characterised by a series of absences. And in combination, these absences have created a context that even the most pessimistic observer would have been hard-pressed to imagine five years ago. And the title of my talk, The Malign Effect of Sustained Neglect, is intended to capture the effect of this dangerous drift on the size of the prison population. The four lacks or absences that I'm going to talk about are, first of all, a lack of urgency, a lack of follow-through, a lack of structure, and finally, a lack of critical scrutiny. Now, these lacks aren't unique to Ireland, but they seem to be more in evidence here than elsewhere, certainly more evident than in other jurisdictions that I'm familiar with. And they characterise, to a greater or lesser degree, arrangements right across the criminal justice spectrum. But I think that their pernicious cumulative effect is most apparent when we look at the hard end of the system, namely the use of imprisonment. So it's the prison population that I'm going to focus on in my remarks today. And before I talk about these lacks in a bit more detail, I'm going to give some background information about our growing infatuation with the prison. And after I set out these lacks in a bit more detail, I'm going to offer a single key performance measure for the prison system and a timescale for achieving it. Now, the conference organisers also asked speakers to come up with concrete proposals for penal reform, and I have three of those that I'll conclude with. So, first of all, the background context about Ireland's imprisonment rate and where it stands internationally. And what I've done on this slide and the next slide is used the figures from the first edition of the World Prison Population List that was published by the Home Office in London in 1999 and the latest edition that was published by the International Centre for Prison Studies uh, last year. And these maps show the rate of imprisonment, so prisoners per 100,000 population in the EU 15, so the member states before the candidate countries joined us in May 2004. And given that the Irish population has grown so dramatically since 1999, there are 750,000 more of us in this part of the country uh, since that time, I'm using rates all the time here rather than numbers so that the increases aren't exaggerated. And if you look at this map from the first prison population list, you'll see that Ireland's in a very favourable uh, position. It's towards the bottom of the league table, if you want to think about it in those terms, the, with an imprisonment rate of 65 nestled there among the Scandinavian countries. You can see 60, 65 in Denmark and so on. The EU average, when this first edition of the list was published, was 85 prisoners per 100,000 population. Ireland was... 20 below average at 65. So the important number there is 20. In 1999, the first edition of the list were 20 points uh, below average. Now, Ireland lagged a fair way behind other European countries at this time. It was also seriously adrift of other common law jurisdictions, jurisdictions that we share a legal tradition and a language with, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the US, and so on. In a book by an American academic called Frieda Adler that came out in 1983, Ireland was described as a nation not obsessed by crime. If the imprisonment rate is any guide, it wasn't, we weren't a country obsessed by punishment, even as recently as the very end of the 20th century. The second map shows the situation according to the most recent edition of the World Prison Population List. This is the one that came out uh, last year. And the message here is one of considerable change much but not all of it in an upward direction. And I have another slide that comes after this that shows you the magnitude of the change in different places. Now the rate in Ireland is 100 prisoners per 100,000 population. It's exactly average. It's no longer 20 below. And what I've done here, just to capture the sense of the magnitude of the change, I've shaded the countries according to the change uh, between the two editions of this list, so from the late 1990s up to the present. And the lighter the colour, the less dramatic the movement. So in a small number of countries, Portugal and Germany being two examples, the rate of imprisonment has decreased. In others, Finland and France, you can see they're a slighter, slightly darker pink, there's been very little movement, which less than 
So countries that exhibit a decrease or very little movement, I group them together as group one on the slide. In some other countries, there's been a moderate increase that I define as moderate as more than 10% and less than 25%. Denmark, England, and Wales uh, come into that category. And in a few countries, the increase can be classed as high. So my definition of high is more than 25%, but less than 50%. Italy and Spain uh, satisfy that definition. So they're groups two and three on the chart. That leaves two uh, countries outstanding, and they stand head or shoulders above the rest. Ireland and Greece, and in each case, the imprisonment rate has increased by more than half in the interval between the publication of the first and most recent editions of the World Prison Population List. I've shown the percentage change there, and so I'll just click onto this next one. Just to show here, the average of the EU 15 is the bottom bar on that chart, Ireland is next, and Greece is at the top. You can see the average increase over this period was 16%, so the pace of change in Ireland was three times the European average. Now, I'm not going to get bogged down in the detail of how these figures were derived and so on, but there's one caveat here, which is that the figure for Greek prisoners that was used in the first edition of the World Prison Population List seems to be erroneous. It was correctly taken from the Council of Europe statistics, but the wrong figure was in them. So if we use a more accurate estimate, the change in Greece is still very substantial. It's not 85% anymore, it's 44%. So it's lower than Ireland's and would fit into the high increase group in my scheme rather than the uh, extreme one. So Ireland and Greece would remain at the top of this fairly dismal table here, but the places uh, would be reversed. So when we iron out that wrinkle, we find ourselves in splendid isolation at the top of the chart as the only country characterised by extreme growth in the prison population over the last decade or so. So that's not a pleasant place uh, to be. I've noted that our imprisonment rate used to be low compared to other common law countries like Australia and England, uh, New Zealand and Canada. Now we're distinguished by our rush to incarcerate. And the change in Ireland is out of line with the change in Canada, where the increase has been about 2% over the same period, and with the US, which has shown an increase of about 15%, uh, with New Zealand and with Australia too. So to summarise the picture, the increase in imprisonment in Ireland is much greater than elsewhere in the common law world. It's also exceptional in an EU context. Now, we're not at the top of the table yet in terms of rate, but we're moving upwards at a fairly uh, disturbing pace. I think there's only one conclusion that can be drawn from this picture that I've sketched uh, fairly briefly, and it's this. Ireland is no longer a low imprisonment country. And the complacency that characterised the debate for a long time here, which was something along the lines of stop griping, it's a lot worse elsewhere, uh, was an impediment to reform, I think, in the past, and now stands as a, a dangerous delusion. <coughs> it's important, I think, to say that, I'll just get there the other common law countries there, this shift has taken place almost entirely in the last five years. The timing of this is really important. By my calculations, in each of the years 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, and 2006, the imprisonment rate fell slightly. Only a tiny bit, but uh, it fell. And I think it's a matter of regret that rather than seizing the opportunity to consolidate this development and work towards a stable number of prisoners, this was the very time when a decision was made to expand capacity um, on a fairly dramatic scale. Also, it's important to state that this isn't the only occasion that the Irish prison population has experienced sudden growth. Between 1983 and 1985, the rate of increase was steeper. It was from a lower base, but the trajectory was steeper. And between 1997 and 1999, there was a surge on a similar scale to what we're witnessing uh, today. In other words, prison growth is not linear. It's not relentlessly, steadily uh, going in one direction. And what's required is to limit the upswings and accentuate the downswings so that the overall pattern is one of relative uh, stability. I've always been cautious interpreting data <coughs> relating to crime and punishment because of the vagaries around their collection and interpretation, the poor quality of the available information and so on, and the danger of mistaking a temporary blip for an enduring trend. But there can be no denying that events have taken a disturbing turn and corrective action is required. <coughs> 
Now, if we do nothing, if there's no concerted action, it's possible that the upward momentum will come to a halt as it has before, and early indications are that the rate of change has slowed down. Now, this might be because of capacity constraints and the increasing use of temporary release as a safety valve to re reduce overcrowding, which means that while the number of sentenced prisoners continues to increase, the number actually incarcerated reaches a limit. So, while still on the subject of numbers, and before I move on to the four lacks that I've identified and offer a key performance indicator for the penal system and some recommendations for reform, there's one more important aspect of this issue to consider. The observed trend is way out of line with Irish prison service predictions. Now, in 2005, In 2005, the Irish Prison Service projected that by 2015, the imprisonment rate per 100,000 population would have fallen slightly to 76. There were high and low projections too. The first suggested a rate of 79, and the latter a rate of 73. This raises an issue of central importance. Why were plans made at huge expense to expand the prison estate when the internal project the internal predictions suggested a downward trend in the imprisonment rate. In 2009, new predictions uh, were prepared, again looking forward to 2015, and these were much more pessimistic than the early ones, as you can see from the slide. The best case scenario for 2015 was an imprisonment rate of 98, and the worst was a rate of 172. Now there's a huge gulf between those two estimates. And it's essentially an entire prison population of a difference between the two. And the 2015 worst case scenario that was projected in 2005 is more benign than the best case scenario for 2015 that was projected in 2009. So what happened between 2005 and 2009 to cause such a dystopian shift? The assumptions underlying the predictions haven't been made public, so we can't interrogate them. But one thing that changed was the commitment to prison expansionism, which dominated criminal justice planning uh, during this period. Uh, rather than seeing these projections as alarming, however wayward they might prove to be, they fed into a context where a commitment to expanding the number of prisoners was being embraced by key decision makers. A prison system demonstrating uncontrolled growth needs gigantic new prisons, so the argument goes. The fact that the imprisonment rate was not growing when the decision to expand was made seems to have been forgotten. And this, I think, is the crucial point uh, to recognize. Just as prison populations can rise because politicians embrace punitiveness or neglect alternative ways of proceeding, so too can prison populations be brought down through acts of political decisiveness. It's for this reason that my remarks today, while reflecting concern at the situation that has been allowed to develop over many years, contain within them the seeds of optimism. The fact that equivalent or greater surges in the imprisonment rate during the 1980s and 1990s were followed by periods of stability is evidence that projections mislead if they assume uninterrupted growth, as seems to be the case with the most recent Irish prison service uh, figures. Now I want to turn briefly to the four lacks that I've identified, beginning with the lack of urgency. It's important not to lose sight of the people behind the statistics. Imprisonment's about much more than numbers, and from time to time events occur that are so horrific they should act as pricks to the nation's conscience. And sometimes personalizing an issue can be an engine for change. And to this end, I'd like to read an extract from a newspaper report that was published some time ago. Gary Douch, 21, was badly beaten and strangled in a sustained attack in a communal cell in Mountjoy Prison on the 1st of August 2006. His killer's excrement was found smeared on the dead man. The suspect, who was regarded as violent, had spent time recently in the Central Mental Hospital. There were six other prisoners in the cell sleeping on mattresses on the floor. None of them raised the alarm, and it was only when they had vacated the cell the following morning that prison officers found Mr. Douch lying among the mattresses. What's notable, first of all, about this sickening attack 
are the circumstances in which it took place. In a crowded cell where a predatory young man was outnumbered but unchallenged by his terrified cellmates. The fact that in a recent report the Council of Europe Committee for the Prevention of Torture declared that three Irish prisons were unsafe shows that this is not an inexplicable aberration. There's a wider context about prisoner safety that needs to be addressed urgently. A commission of investigation was set up the following year after a report by a former civil servant identified a number of serious deficiencies. When the Minister for Justice, it was Michael McDougall at the time, set up this commission headed by Gronje McMorrow, senior counsel, in April 2007, and the dates, the chronology is important here, he announced that he expected it to report before the end of the year. The commission had been established under the Commissions of Investigation Act 2004 because the government deemed Mr. Douch's death to raise matters of significant public concern. An eight-month time frame for a report with quite tightly defined terms of reference seemed realistic at the time. But even allowing for slippage, one might have expected a report by the end of the following year, by the end of 2008. It would appear that the inquiry has yet to report more than four and a half years after its report was expected. Now, I understand a draft of the report has been circulated, people are commenting on it, and the finished product is some way uh, distant even now. Not to bring such a tragic set of circumstances to a timely conclusion, for whatever reason or combination of reasons, sends out a powerful negative message about priorities. And quite apart from the personal tragedy for the Douch family, the events around this killing were deemed to be of significant public concern. That's why a statutory investigation was established in the first place. The absence of sustained debate that follows events such as the savagery, savagery and degradation that characterised Gary Douch's final hours suggests a deep reservoir of public and political apathy. By contrast, an inquiry into the murder of a young offender, Zahid Mubarak, by his cellmate in England was initiated in April 2004. The inquiry's 700-page, two-volume report was published by the House of Commons in June 2006. This followed previous detailed investigations by the Prison Service and the Commission for Racial Equality. The UK government committed itself to providing a full response to the report's 88 recommendations within two months of the publication date. From the start of the process to the deadline for implementing all of the report's recommendations, 28 months. This compares with 65 months and counting for Guy Douch. I don't think I need to say anything else about the lack of urgency that characterises prison matters. This, my second lack, is a corollary of the lack of urgency. So even when reports are brought to a conclusion, there's no guarantee that the recommendations will be implemented. And I'm just going to give one uh, example of this, which is about uh, prison hygiene. A prison hygiene policy group was set up in, in 1993. When its report was finally published in 1997, it contained very strong language about the importance of decent conditions and how a lack of in-cell sanitation was demeaning and degrading. It noted that the government already had plans to provide in-cell sanitation across the board by 1999 and recommended that that program should be accelerated and in the meantime, 24-hour access to sanitation should be provided. As things stand, 15 years after the Prison Hygiene Policy Group reinforced the government's decision to abolish this disgusting practice, more than one in four prisoners continues to stop out. Now, in its three-year strategic plan published on April the 30th of this year, the Irish Prison Service gave a commitment to end slopping out within 40 months, so the target is still moving. And I think it's salutary to remember that when Mountjoy Prison opened in 1850, each cell was fitted with a flushing toilet. If the current timetable is adhered to, we'll be back to this situation by the summer of 2015. Structure. One of the strengths of the Irish system in the past was its informal and discretionary nature, which allowed decisions to be tailored to individual circumstances. When serious crime was unusual and the prison population was low, this meant that prisoners benefited in ways that are no longer the case. Now, time is short, so I'm just going to give one quick example of where a lack of structure that was unproblematic in the past has become problematic today. And that's the species of temporary release that we call parole. This process remains avowedly political. It lacks formality, transparency, and independence. 
the Minister for Justice and Law Reform makes a determination of the issue of release for every uh, life, or life sentenced and long term offender having received a recommendation from the Parole Board. The secrecy surrounding the parole process does not serve prisoners, decision makers, victims and victims' families or the public. The scrutiny of parole in other jurisdictions has facilitated greater levels of accountability, produced research to assist in restructuring both the process and individual decision making, and fostered a more open approach to the provision of information to prisoners, the public and victims. There's been no such scrutiny in Ireland, but things have changed profoundly for those serving long sentences. Lifers released on licence today will have spent a decade longer in custody than their counterparts who were released in the early 1980s, 17 years as opposed to seven and a half years. So the structure of parole requires a radical overhaul and I have a recommendation to make in this regard that I'll return to in a few minutes. The extent to which the criminal justice system operates in the absence of informed comment, research and critical scrutiny is striking. The good quality information that's required to allow a sensible discussion uh, largely is non-existent. Substantial data deficits remain at every level and progress linking systems from the different agencies is slow. There are still far too many simple questions that cannot be answered. For example, what is the average sentence for a first time burglar? Do members of minority groups experience the criminal justice system differently? How many years of imprisonment do the courts impose each year? What does it feel like to be in prison? And so on. All of the lacks that I've identified, urgency, follow through, structure and critical scrutiny, have been allowed to persist because of a final lack, that of public concern. It's become a platitude to say that a country has the criminal justice system it deserves, but there can be little doubt that such a powerless state of affairs would be less likely to persist in the face of sustained public opposition. I'm not arguing that there's been anything deliberate about the processes uh, that I've identified, but benign neglect has had malign uh, effect. And the confluence of these stream, <coughs> streams leads to what I call a corrosive drift. Uh, where, uh, when action is taken, it's often disproportionate or short-lived or both. Now, as I move on to a conclusion, I want to offer one objective measure of policy performance I'll set out a single, easily stated objective with which policy should be aligned and give a time frame for its achievement. When I showed in the first slide the prison population in 1999, you might remember it was 20 points below the EU average. It was 65 uh, in Ireland versus 85 across the EU. When the ninth edition appeared in 2011, we'd moved up to occupy the average position of 100. Now, it might be too ambitious to suggest that we get back to a rate of 65, given the slight upward drift in comparator countries, but I think it would be reasonable to argue for a return to our relative position. So, in other words, we'd once again take up a position 20 points below average. What would that mean at the moment? Well, an imprisonment rate of around 80 per 100,000. As most of the increase that I've described took place during the last five years, a similar time frame seems appropriate in terms of bringing the situation back under control. So to put this in concrete terms, assuming everything else remains constant, the national population, the rates of change in other countries and so on, we're talking about aiming to bring the prison population from around 4,500 to around 3,600 3, and to do this by 2017. Now, it says something about the reckless expansion that's characterised the last decade, that this modest target will probably be considered wildly ambitious by those with a, resp a responsibility for penal planning. So it's important to stress that we didn't cross this threshold in terms of numbers until 2009. I think it's encouraging that the Minister and the new Director General of the Prison Service have embraced the principle of parsimony in the use of punishment, and it's refreshing to hear them talk about approaches other than expansionism and new buildings. And time will tell whether a more considered approach along the lines they're advocating has the desired effect. Decentering the prison is in everyone's interest. It's not just about cost savings, although there may be some of these. It's about fairness and it's about justice. Prisons bear down most heavily on those who are already marginalized in numerous ways. And given the current economic crisis that absorbs all of us who are resident in, in, in this jurisdiction, 
There can be few people who cling to the eccentric belief that the petty persistent thieves and rowdy drunks and fine defaulters who account for most, the majority of prison admissions each year, are those who have done the greatest damage to Irish society and deserve increasingly harsh treatment. Indeed, one wonders if the criminal justice system devoted as much attention to white collar offenders as to fine defaulters, would its deficiencies be addressed with greater determination and speed. Now, conference speakers were invited to offer concrete proposals. I've got three, and I think they have one virtue, which is that it lies within the powers of those who make law and policy in the area to give effect to them. They don't require a wider social transformation. They don't require the reduction of income inequality. They don't require a shift in public opinion or a downward spiral in the crime rate. They don't require an overall of sentencing practice. These are all, no doubt, desirable things in their own right, but they're difficult and they're time-consuming to achieve, and certainly the realisation would extend beyond the lifetime of any one government, thus weakening, lessening their political attractiveness, if you like. So what are my recommendations? The first is to support temporary release, the second to reform parole, and the third to remember, whoops, to remember remission. Maybe we can sort that out. I'll speak for a moment or two on each of these, and then I'll wind up. The law allows for temporary release, TR, on humanitarian or family grounds, or to facilitate vocational training. And this can be offered on a, granted on a renewable basis over a fixed period of time until the sentence expiry date. I think the willingness to exercise discretion in favour of prisoners and their families says something about the emphasis the prison system places on trust. I think it's a more eloquent expression of faith in the individual's capacity to rise to expectations than any mission statement or set of performance measures. And the granting of TR to a significant number of prisoners every Christmas used to be a defining characteristic of the Irish prison system. It's virtually disappeared. On average, between the early 1960s and the mid-1990s, more than one in eight prisoners were allowed home for Christmas. Last year, the figure was one in 25. A part of this explanation must lie in the emergence of a more diverse prison population. There are more remand prisoners. They're ineligible for temporary release. There are more prisoners from overseas. They may lack the requisite community contacts. But it may also indicate a punitive shift within the criminal justice system and the emergence of a less forgiving mentality on the part of those with whom the power to grant TR resides. I think the decline of this practice indicates the oozing of compassion from a system that was characterised by it. Temporary release is important because it's effective. A follow-up study of 20,000 prisoner releases carried out at the UCD Institute of Criminology showed that prisoners who were occasionally allowed outside for vocational or family-related purposes were less likely to be re-imprisoned, and this held for four years uh, post-release. So there are, that's a good empirical demonstration of the benefits, other than purely humanitarian ones, of maintaining prisoner social capital. And when prisoners repay trust with good behaviour, there are rewards, I think, for all of us. The second uh, recommendation I have for change is about reforming parole. I've mentioned already how little has changed in parole decision making in the last uh, half century. And I think there's one step that could be taken without delay here, and that's to widen the parole eligibility window. In, I'll just give one, one statistic to illustrate that. In Finland, parole is possible after 14 days. In Ireland, the earliest possible review is after 1,460 days. My recommendation here is, why not make parole a possibility for anyone sentenced to four years or more rather than eight years or more, which is the present situation? My third recommendation, and I'll just mention in 30 seconds and then make my concluding remarks, is to remember remission. Enhanced remission, everybody who serves a determinate sentence of imprisonment gets 25% uh, chopped off. They can lose it if they misbehave. It's possible under the prison rules for somebody to get enhanced remission, which is a 33% reduction, if they take part in treatment programmes. The potential of this facility to reduce sentences has, hasn't been exploited. Employing it more widely would serve several purposes. It would incentivise prisoners to take part in programmes that reduce the threat they pose, reduce prison overcrowding, usher in a more structured approach to release, and save money. So to conclude, I'd like to note that politicians in Ireland, perhaps unlike their counterparts in other areas, have sometimes shown commendable restraint when it comes to setting the tone of the debate about crime and punishment. And the challenge today is to create a context 
where citizens believe the penal system to be legitimate and trust legislators to formulate rational, effective and proportionate responses, and where legislators are confident enough to challenge the centrality of the prison at every opportunity. Now, getting this right is extremely difficult, but vitally important. To facilitate such a process, it would be necessary to begin a new national conversation about the place of the prison in society, to reimagine the prison as this conference enjoins us to do, and I've a suggestion about how we might begin this dialogue that I just mentioned to you before I sit down. Why not start the conversation going by bringing together serving and former prisoners, academics, policymakers, politicians, judges, and reform groups? Following the model perhaps established in Norway, where since 1968 there's a three day conference every year in the same place around the same time of the year where people from each side of the criminal justice divide come together to share experiences and engage in mutual uh, learning. These conferences are attended by social workers, lawyers, researchers, officials from the Ministry for Justice, prison service personnel and so on. Prisoners are granted temporary release uh, to attend. In the early days, officials from the Ministry refused to participate, now they do so as a matter of course. The debates are fairly vigorous at these uh, meetings and the exchanges are open and complacency is challenged, contacts are built up and so on. There's an opportunity to think more deeply about issues that are sometimes responded to hastily in a crisis or superficially by an excitable media. Now if we tried such an initiative here, I think there'd be predictable hoots of derision from certain quarters about pampered prisoners enjoying hotel breaks at the expense of the hard-pressed taxpayer. But I think that such opposition could be overcome if the impetus to organise a discussion like that um, existed. I think that public attitudes to punishment are ambivalent. An unforgiving streak coexists with an appetite for restorative justice. A desire to see criminals receive their just deserts sits alongside an appreciation that those who come before the court are the worst offenders are the greatest threats to society. Rehabilitation, retribution, deterrence and incapacitation are all jostling for attention in the public mind. So what would be wrong with giving judges and politicians an opportunity to learn firsthand about the real impact of imprisonment? I think that this might be one way of narrowing the empathy gap that exists between offenders and those who deal with them. Now, it would be naive to think that such an event in isolation would have a transformative impact or bring our prison population down to an acceptable level. But one thing I think is certain. The public would benefit from a slimmed down prison system, which released men and women who are less angry, less embittered, and better equipped to play a constructive role in society. And any step that might take us in that direction is worth considering. Thank you.